And we're back. Another day at the office, ladies and gentlemen. Lo and behold, after my little hiatus, the Utah Jazz have uh, still been the exact same way as when I left. You know, a little bit more injury riddled, but that's about all we got for you, gentlemen. Obviously, the list of inactives was quite long for the Jazz today, uh, starting with Chris Dunn. Jordan Clarkson still out. Walker Kessler still out. Well, out rather. Larry Markin still pulled. John Collins was out. And for the first time all season, Colin Sexton was listed as an inactive due to illness. He was downgraded a couple hours before the game. Go figure. Now, in that same vein, we saw a bunch of new faces and a bunch of the rookies, you know, get some quality burn for the most part. Uh, the only people that really didn't was Kenneth Lofton Jr., Potter, and Lewis Jr. That said, you saw Lucas Salmonich start at the small forward spot. Taylor Hendrick had the power forward. Omer Yurt seven at the center. Johnny at the shooting guard. And Keontae at the point guard. Off the bench, you saw the person with the most minutes being THT. Then Darius Basley, then Bryce, then Jason Preston with six minutes at the end there. Overall, you know, 95 to 111, considering the lineup and the rotation that was played, uh, isn't the most insane thing considering the fact that the Utah Jazz uh, played against a fully healthy and weaponized version of the, you know, Denver Nuggets. Minus, of course, you know, Aaron Gordon. But did you really need Aaron Gordon to win this game? Obviously not. In that same vein, you saw them have Christian Braun start in his place. Michael Porter, excuse me, Michael Porter Jr. was put in. They slid him, at, listed him at the power forward spot. Didn't really change much about his game. Jokic obviously at the center. KCP at shooting guard and Jamal Murray at the point guard position. Off the bench, they had Peyton Watson, Reggie Jackson, Justin Holiday, Zeke Naji. And then at the very end of the game, you saw them empty out the last part of their bench, with the exception of DeAndre Jordan, who's still been, you know, a little bit of an inactive piece. That said, things were a little bit, uh, everything went according to the script, honestly. If you were to sit there and list out these, you know, these players against each other, it made the most sense that this is what the way things were going to end. You saw Michael Porter 5 13 from the field. He did shoot 2 of 7 from 3. You saw Jokic go 12 for 20, 2 of 2 from 3, 2 of 2 from the free throw line. He had 13 boards, 17 assists. Excuse me, 7 assists, not 17. 7 assists, which led his team, by the way. And 28 points, which tied for the leader on his team. Alongside Jamal Murray, the one and only who was 11 of 20, 4 of 10 from 3, 2 of 4 from the free throw line. Had 2 rebounds, 4 assists, but he also had 4 steals and 4 blocks. Um, which is uh, a little bit of an anomaly game uh, defensively, to say the least. But at the end of the day, he got the job done, right? They were naturally not very turnover-prone. Jokic actually had a significant number of turnovers. I don't recall him being a very turnover-prone individual player. But today was that day. You know, seven assists to five turnovers is not is not great. But when he also poured in 13 boards, shot 60% from the field on 20 shot attempts and tied for leading your team with 28 points against a ailing Utah Jazz team that's, you know, crumbling and uh, limping into the golf season. It really didn't take much. Then, of course, you got KCP, 3 of 5 from the field in his 30 minutes. He was 0 of 2 from 3. He had two boards. He had four assists, a calm block, only one turnover, six points. Box score plus minus of plus 18. Jokic, by the way, was a plus 23. Jamal Murray was a plus 22. Michael Porter was a plus 15. And Christian Braun was a plus 17. Off the bench, the only really, there was only really two notable shot chuckers off the bench. Peyton Watson, two of seven. Um, he also had nine rebounds though and four assists. But then you had Reggie Jackson, who was four of thirteen from the field, one of six from three, and had four rebounds, five assists, total of nine points for him. None of their major rotation pieces ended up with a negative box score plus minus any of the minutes that they played. It wasn't until. Uh, Zeke Naji and Justin Holiday, who played 18 and 12 minutes respectively, where you see them take that first significant dip. The Utah Jazz, of course, with Lucas Salmonich at the small four spot playing 
the second most minutes on the team behind only Omer. You're at seven. He went six of 15 from the field, one of three from three, two of two from the free throw line. He had 10 boards, three assists, and only one turnover for a total of 15 points. And the greatest, and by greatest, I do mean worst, box score plus minus on the team today at a negative 24. Taylor Hendrickson, 22 minutes, was one of five from the field, one of two from the three-point line. You saw him go hit, five, excuse me, grab five rebounds, one assist, one steal, one block, no turnovers. Total of three points in a box score plus minus of a negative seven, um, which, by the way, was the best out of all five of the starters. Omer, year seven, I would say probably had the best game. Honestly, when I looked at these numbers, I was like, dang, I wish one of these days when Walker Kessler was healthy and, and you know, we were winning games. I wish we could have seen this kind of game out of him. The man Omer, year seven, shot nine of 14 from the field. He did miss the one three that he took, but he was two of two from the free throw line. He had 11 rebounds with four of them being offensive. He had two assists, two steals. He didn't have any blocks, and he did have three turnovers, which was third on the team. But he had 20 points and a box score plus minus of a negative 16. So, honestly, the offensive bag that he exp expressed today, I was hoping it would make – it made me wish that Walker Kessler could have Omer Year 7's offensive game matched with his own defensive game. I think that would be a very ideal dynamic duo of, you know, skill sets to put together. Uh, Johnny, obviously at the shooting guard spot, 32 minutes, 2 of 8 from the field, 1 of 4 from 3. He had 2 boards, 3 assists, and only 1 turnover, 5 points. Box score plus minus was the second worst out of anybody playing today at a negative 22. And then the one and only Keontae George starting at the point guard spot going for 30 minutes, four of 11 from the field, two of nine from three. He had three boards, five assists, and five turnovers. Yes, sir. That is a one-to-one -one assist to turnover ratio, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> he had 10 points and a box score plus minus of a negative 15. And then you transition to the bench where Darius Basley would play 25 minutes, two far from the field, missed both of his three-pointers, but did hit all four of his free throws, had five boards and one steal, eight points total, and a box score plus minus of a negative three. Bryce Sensible in 20 minutes, interestingly enough, was two of a nine from the field, one of two from three, five of five from the free throw line. He had five boards, two assists, and he actually did not have any turnovers and a total of 10 points for himself. And he was the only person that played more than 10 minutes and had a positive box score plus minus at a plus four. So uh, good job, Bryce, I guess. Um, interest it's interesting to see. I need to look back and see what actually a lineup, what actual lineup that he was a part of that yielded this result, or what run yielded this result rather. Being that literally nobody else is in the positive except for Jason Preston, who had played six minutes and was 0 of 1 from the field and had one assist. Um, he, by the way, is a box score plus minus of a plus eight. THT in 32 and a half minutes, uh, being the player with the third most minutes played in this game. Had a little bit of a resurgence going 10 of 23 from the field, 4 of 8 from 3. He had 3 boards, 2 assists, 1 steal, 1 block. But he did have the second most turnovers on the team with 4. So yes, that is in fact a 0 0.5 assist to turnover ratio. 0.5 to 1, by the way. That's not very good. At it. In fact, that's terrible. But that's not the point, right? He was able to enjoy a decent game, put up some decent numbers. And honestly, I think that he enjoyed, uh, you know, after being on the bench for as long as he has and playing just minuscule minutes, him being able to have the opportunity that he had today, I think made a pretty big difference for him overall. Now, with that being said, we turn to the chat. What's up, Blizzard? Appreciate you, Pete. Yeah, man. Uh, explain 21 minutes for Hendrix. Honestly, we're cooked. That's the only thing I got for you. We are cooked. We've been cooked. We shall be cooked this year. We are the the not the most cooked organization in the NBA, but we've just completely thrown in the towel. There's no like uh, disguising it anymore. Obviously, they're gonna say you know once they said Colin Sexton was sick, I was like, oh yeah, so we're just we're just doing stuff now. It's like Colin Sexton, by the way, has been active the entire year, right? Like he's played in every game. He, he hasn't been hurt. He never let anything keep him out. He's always been ready to go. He's always been the consistent player. And that's why I appreciate him always being, you know, Colin Sexton, high energy guy, high effort guy, just pushes himself to exhaustion every single chance that he gets. Love the man, you know, love the play style. Taylor Hendricks, 21, only 
<laughs> almost 22 minutes. Um, offensively, obviously, that one of five wasn't pretty, but overall, Taylor Hendricks out of the three rookies is the one that I prefer the most. I'm not gonna lie because the other two either aren't they're okay. So let me rephrase that. Rookies aren't historically very good at defense, but objectively, Keontae George has been out of the three, by my estimation and from the tape that I've seen, has been the worst. Um, he's also been the one that's been on the NBA team the longest. I thought Bryce Sensible was going to be the worst because at Ohio State, he was allowed to shoot whatever shot he wanted. Granted, he shot efficiently from the field, and that shooting percentage did transition into the G League. Defensively, everything didn't transition in the G League. But he made a smoother transition to this, with the exception of the recent shooting slumps that he's had. He popped out for a minute, I think had, what, back-to-back 18 or 22-point games. Him and Taylor Hendricks were interchangeable. And then that next game, they all, all three rookies played like six minutes and got benched. But all in all... Uh, I'm highest on Taylor Hendricks, hence the video. I have a Bryce Sensible video dropping soon. I need to get back on the, the grind of just forcing myself along. I'm not going to lie. Because when you see games uh, where you're supposed to be focusing on the development of the players and you see somebody make a mistake on a play design that has been run all season by like older players and just more veteran players in the system and seeing the younger guys just mess it up or guys that have been on the bench all year and have had the opportunity to watch other guys make mistakes, and then they come in the game and make the same mistake or double down and make a worse mistake, it can be kind of frustrating from uh, from my point of view as I'm not am I just an avid enjoyer of basketball, but I'm also just a student of the game. I enjoy, I enjoy watching schemes. I enjoy watching videos about breaking down plays and sets and things like that, and I haven't quite figured out how I would end up like curating that and adding that to this channel, but I do want to make it a staple next year at the very least. So we could do a little bit more of a deep dive because I do enjoy those basketball conversations, but nevertheless, uh, Taylor Hendricks out of the three rookies is the one that I prefer. Johnny is an interesting character, but I just don't think that he's maybe it's because, uh, games like this, he's like the lowest, not he's the lowest, but the talent around him just isn't the highest pool. Like you don't have, if you don't have a lot of guys, strong guys to lean on, obviously your game's going to falter because when you defer to somebody, they're no better than you are. Um, Cause when you look at this lineup, Lucas Omanich, Taylor Hendricks, Johnny, Keontae, Taylor, none of those guys are like elite scores to begin with. You have Keontae who will always shoot double digit shots and he's either going to have a really great shooting night or really bad shooting night. Right. Um, Today, again, it continues this trend of not good shooting nights. But Omer Year 7 came alive and had his himself a 20 and 11 game, which was fantastic. Honestly, that was the highlight of the night for me. Um, it was enjoyable. Especially considering the fact that I've been, I'm, I'm fond of Omer Year 7, even though he doesn't play significantly. Um, honestly, he doesn't have the exact same defensive upside as Walker Hazel because he's not as viable as, of a shot blocker. Still a decent enough rim protector, but just not not a shot blocker to begin with. Not in, definitely not an elite shot blocker if you want to call him a shot blocker at all. But offensively, he does all the things that I would love to see Walker Kessler do. Now, is he always going to hit the the one to two threes that he takes when he's given the opportunity? No, but he's darn sure going to take them. And honestly, that's the biggest thing about Walker Kessler because in the offseason last season, he was working with Kelly Olynyk and Larry Markkinen and their shooting coach on transitioning his, his jumper into something more fluid instead of making it a catapult motion, just, you know, a one pull kind of thing, just up and out. And while it got better, we never got to see it in game because when he would be open in the corner and get that catch, he wouldn't shoot the ball. And maybe it was by design at times, but you know, if it happens seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times in a game and you're only playing 27 minutes, you got to be willing to take at least two of those attempts because if you don't, Nobody's going to respect the shot to begin with. Nobody's going to close out on you. And then you're never going to have the opportunity to really get a backdoor cut because the big is just going to sit close to the paint and help protect the rim. Just how it goes, you know. But life continues on, man. Life continues on. We said, uh, Kurt, what's up, man? You said another deep dive for you looking in last year's draft. How are the players that we didn't draft but could have performed this year? Mmm. Are there any players that we missed on last year? I like that. That's a great idea. I like that a lot. But there aren't. Let me think. Who off the top uh, could we consider? Because obviously Taylor Hendricks was our highest drafted at night at number nine. 
Um, so obviously none of the really, really big premier guys we were going to have a shot at anyways. Um, you saw Keontae go at 14 and then, uh, sense of all was what, 20, 21 or something, 19 or 21, some, somewhere in there. I don't think it was like late, like 30. Um, but yeah, yeah. nevertheless, uh, it's still worthy of talking about 100%, 100%. I'm definitely with it. 28. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, down. that's a great idea. Actually. I'm definitely down for that one. We said, of course, we didn't really look like anyone after Hendrix. We really missed out. Maybe I missed someone. I like Basley. Yeah, he's an interesting talent. Um, he's not a bad defender either, um, which is which is nice. You know, he's not a great defender, but he's definitely not a bad. He's not a. It's not disgusting to watch him play defense. And I think that's part of the battle for him specifically because you want to be able to enjoy, you know, basketball. But when guys make guys, young guys are going to make mistakes, we understand that it happens. But you don't want to hate the process while you're going through it. You'd much rather just you know be like, oh, it happened, and then they come down, they make a cool play. Oh, that's reasonable, you know. Just just slow ticks upward. We don't need anything gargantuously magnificent out the gate. Will we love it, of course. I'm never going to turn down an elite player or an elite prospect. But at the same time, I don't need you to be elite or magnificent in the beginning. We can. I'm willing to enjoy the bumps and bruises of the road along the way, so long as we get to that peak of the mountain where we get to see truly where your potential lies. And I think that Basley is, he's starting to rise on me a little bit. Um, out of all the guys that play today, we know what Omer is. Omer is always reliable. I've always felt like he should have played more minutes. Um, we just haven't played him more minutes. <laughs> um, but and and to be fair, in the beginning of the season, we had a more loaded front court. There just wasn't really time. Now in the season, it's just like oh, we just don't. Um, which, depending on how you look at it, you could you could understand or you could just be irritated by it. Lucas Salmanich, no offense to his game, but I just I, I don't have the highest expectations for him at the NBA level. Taylor Hendricks, I think out of all the guys that started today, I have the highest. Johnny, sometimes I really like the way his game looks, and then other times I really don't like it, so I'm just kind of up in the air about him. I'd like to believe that Keontae will develop into a proper player and a proper scoring guard, um, but then the thing is, a lot of times it isn't the shots that he takes, it's just that him he doesn't hit the shots, but it's he him not being able to do it on such a consistent basis. Like, if I am to, I'm going to pop open his stats in a new tab, he was already fluttering right there at 40%. So I think he might, over the past couple of games, games have drip, dropped like right back under 30%. Yeah, he's at 38.6% from the field and 32.8% from three on six attempts from three and 11 attempts from the field a game. The one encouraging thing is that uh, he averages three free throws a game and he's shooting 85.5%. So the jumper should be able to get there. It should be coming in. And generally speaking, most rookie guards don't have the, gris, the greatest track record of being super efficient. Um, I guess one of the few, he's not an Anthony Edwards kind of guy where he's going to come in pretty solid, all, pretty efficient, you know, pretty like on top of things. Like that wasn't the expectation for him coming in. So we're willing to, you know, give him those opportunities, give him those chances. But I'm not the highest on him at all times. I understand that some people are. We said, I would have started year seven all year. Kessler would have rode the bench with the HD. <laughs> Agreed. You said, let me see. Omer, you're at seven. Agreed, you're at seven. First caught my attention when he was playing with the Heat preseason. Mm. I think George has already turned into, has been Jordan Clarkson, missing the fourth letter of the alphabet. Yeah, yeah, he is missing the D. It took me a second. To, it took me a second to, to catch that elite reference. That's a great reference, by the way. He said, let me see here. Hendricks has the had the biggest upside. He came from the small time competition. He needs G League reps to gain confidence. Keontae George makes a lot of newbie mistakes on the court. He hasn't been that sentient of a player in the last 
15 to 20 games. Yeah, and I think that's the most concerning thing because then in, in my head, if you give because Keontae's played in a significant number of games this season, like people actually don't realize, like, yes, now he was the beneficiary of playing really good and being healthy in the summer league. So he was given extra time. This man has played in 72 games this season. 72. He's only missed like I want to say like four-ish with injury uh, when he had that one ank- that one foot injury. I think it was. Um, but like he's had the time. He's played on average 27 minutes a night. He started a significant number of games now too. He's started, I think, om- over half of the games that he played now. And that's not to say I expect him to be perfect, but I kind of expect him to have progressed a little bit longer, like a little, just, just a touch further. Because I think if you give Taylor Hendricks 72 games with the Jazz in the, in the, in the current condition that they were, like as the season went on, with those same refs that Keontae George got, I think that we see tremendous progress from Taylor Hendricks offensively. Defensively, the, the effort's always been there. It's just been about him understanding where he's supposed to be on the floor. He'll try and make the play. He just has to remember, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be so that I can make the play. And every now and then you catch him out of position. But for the most part, you see him going through the progression of getting better. You give that man 72 games and 27 minutes per night, he played 22 minutes today, not even. And so if you give him that same sample size of opportunity, I think that he he the upside that he presents is better than Keontae George. I... I, I want to say it about Bryce, but I can't say it just yet because he's having the same shooting slump issue, and I didn't think that he was um, until he did. So, yeah, there's that. We said Keontae, man. Uh, Hendricks is kind of good. He's slowly growing in the system. I can't explain it, but he's coming slow instead. Yeah. And I'm glad that we had the opportunity to bring him all along slow because in the beginning of the season, remember we had uh Kellyana, we had Fontecchio, we had Lowry, we had uh Walker, we had John Collins. Like we had a stacked front court, so we didn't need him. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, we we're trying to win games right now, brother. You have to play, you gotta be you gotta be like that. Like you gotta make people feel like you can go toe-to-toe with Wemby. That was never the expectation. So us being able to like bring him along slowly but surely was what made the ultimate difference. And I love that. He said he's strong. He can body up. Mm-hmm. Hendrix should hit the weight room in the offseason. He's much better for us. Everything will come with time. Give Omer your more time. He's big enough for today's game. Plus, he can get a bucket when needed. The question is, can he play with Collins? Speaking of which, what do we do with him? I wonder if Collins is going to be more tradable now because obviously a year is now off of his contract again, I think he still has what three years left. It's two or three years left. Um, obviously it's big money, and a lot of people don't want to pay that. But the closer you get towards his contract expiring, the more tradable he starts looking to other GMs and other front offices. Because it's like, okay, even if he isn't a great player, right? He's still gonna be serviceable and at the right budget. So there's gonna be teams that are gonna be willing to like, you know. Let it that that they're going to be willing to go ahead and make that gamble and just accept that they're not going to force that out there and just be like, oh, this is what it has to be. Oh, we can't afford to do that. If there's going to be a team that's going to have the cash space and the opportunity to do it, and they're just going to need like a scoring punch or someone that's going to be a viable lob threat and do some decent defense, and it'll happen. But I don't know if it happens this off season. That's the only thing I wonder. We said. Uh, Hey, you're pissed. <laughs> you said if you buy season tickets, you should get a partial refund if a ton of starters miss games on a consistent basis because obviously we are taking. Today brings up a very good point. I'm not gonna lie because this is just over the top. Keontae was given time when we were playing good. Taylor only got time when we gave up. Exactly. Like imagine, imagine Taylor Hendricks um getting minutes uh, either alongside Kelly Olynyk, right? Or alongside just a healthy front court and back court. Imagine him on the court in a lineup. Let's say you let's say you you pull John Collins out of the starting lineup at at the peak. Because remember, it was Chris Dunn, it was um, Colin Sexton, it was Larry Markinen, it was my brain's my brain's selling me right now. Oh, it was Fontecchio, and then it was also um, 
what's his name? And then it was John Collins. So even if you keep John Collins out there, let's say every now and then um, you have Fontecchio, when, Font when Fontecchio misses a game, you have Taylor Hendricks in that role, in that little niche area. Because you could, I don't know if you want to play them both beside each other unless you want them to occupy opposite corners of the court, which is doable because they did have a similarly interchangeable game. In that same vein, though, I think that he, I think that his offensive game flourishes then, because you have a guy like Kristen who's going to be defense first, who's going to be great for a guy like Taylor Hendricks' development, because you're going to have a teammate that's going to be real, accountable for their own decisions. You're not going to be expected to just clean up on everything, right? You're going to have the opportunity to go along with things and trust that they're going to get the job done on their end. And if they don't, then you can help. It's not, oh, I'm expecting this person to get blown by. I'm expecting him to get cooked, right? And that's another thing and that from that senior leadership standpoint. And then on offense, Ted, Chris Dunn is not known for hunting his own shot. That's not been his brand of basketball with the Jazz. It's always been getting the other guys involved and putting the ball in their hands when they need to get a bucket and in scoring position. And he's been a great table setter, you know? Um, Keontae George isn't there yet. Colin Sexton made great strides. I still love Chris Dunn at that, at that in that situation. It would have been cheaper for me to buy individual tickets and I would have gotten better seats. That's disgusting. That's actually, that actually like irritated me reading that. The Jazz might never win a game again. Uh, this season's cooked. This season, this season's cooked. It's over with. We said, who's the said is Chris Paul a better point guard than John Stockton? Uh, it depends on your brand of basketball. Oh, Kuzi, were you talking to, to, uh, to Cam about it? Is that where that question came from? I think that's where that came from. Then they'll say how much they value their ticket holders this offseason. They don't. Of course not. Are you going to renew next year? That's going to be the question for real. Keontae did well when we were playing good, but we didn't need him to excel. Keontae was definitely better than he is right now. I'm not going to lie. But I think the best version of Keontae was post, uh, what was that, ankle or foot injury. Like those first like 10 to 15-ish games after he came back was the most consistent he had been all season. He wasn't great, right? But he was pretty darn consistent. There was a lot more 44, 48, 42% games shooting from the field like during that span of time than at any other point in his season. I would say that. Um, we said Hendricks never got that benefit. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kuzi Fina for attention. Oh, there you are, Kim. Yeah, <laughs> maybe um, double or nothing. I'm trying to get a ticket added to my package so I could bring another. But they said it wasn't available in the area I wanted. Yeah, I'm calling Cap too as well because because I yeah no that, that makes sense to me. But cancel if I don't get that. Yeah, I understand that. How is it that Bryce is making better decisions than THT and Luca? Hey, man. Uh, Luca Salmonich has never been a great decision maker. That's why I don't, I'm not very high on his, not his, not his uh, basketball ability, but just his ability to be long term successful in the NBA and just really like put things together. Uh, it really gets called into questions when I see him play 35 minutes and he does certain things that he does and takes certain shots that he took. He led the team in shooting today. 15. He only made six. <laughs> Neither here nor there, though, right? But yeah. <laughs> Somebody boot this man. <laughs> Put him in timeout. Kurt said, you're asking the wrong question. Ban for ban, Kurt. <laughs> Yo, what? Kuzi is on one today. He said, I'm going to cut Keontae the same slack I've cut Colin Sexton. It's not his fault. Easier to assist, to be an assist first point guard when you have shooters next to you like Larry Fontecchio Sexton. Fair play. Fair play. Yeah, I can definitely respect that. Are the Jazz making the plan? As in next year, it depends on what approach they decide to take. If they actually care to win games and they allow the right rob the right rotations to get played, then absolutely, I could definitely see that. But if they decide to, you know, put no effort into it and don't pick anybody up in the offseason and don't draft particularly well, 
and they're fine tanking, um, then then yeah, it, it, that's it. That's all they got. And so on. Yeah. The better career. Who had the better career? Uh, the more legendary career to date has was has been Stockton. I'm I personally I like if I if I'm building a team I would much rather have uh CP3 just because of the different types of basketball that he's had to learn throughout his career and the level of cerebral intelligence that he has. But overall, um, one cannot deny that John Stockton has been known as like tier one point guard of all time. And while CP3 has also been respected as such, most people don't even talk about CP3 no more. And brother's still in the league. Like he's paired up with the greatest shooter of all time. And we don't talk about this dude at all. And there's something to be said about that. I know we're not going to talk about it, right? But it, maybe it's a sidebar conversation that you have. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's different. Oh, you said the same slack. I cut Jordan Clarkson. Ooh, Clarkson slack might be a little bit tough. I give I give Keontae George more slack than I more more. Uh, I give him more grace than I give Colin, uh, Jordan Clarkson. I'm not gonna lie. Jordan Clarkson was at one point in my in my uh, in my grace back, like he was in my prayers, and then and then he did a couple things, and I was like, okay, there's one thing to be rough because of situation. But when you consistent, when you end up being into a situation where you're having worst, your worst statistically shooting season of all time, and I've seen you play with some god awful rosters, brother. I remember, I remember those lineups. I can't tell you who the starting five was on the Lakers, but I know you were in it. And then he he, he shoots like this. It's like, uh, and keep shooting. Like it's one thing to have a poor shooting year. It happens. It happens to the best of them. I mean, well, not the best of them, but it happens to really good players on a consistent basis. Everybody goes through slumps, ebbs, and flows in their game. But when you are shooting very poorly from the field and you continue to tunnel down, um, now if that's your role, right, and the expectation from the coaching staff is you're on the court to shoot the ball, MF, you better shoot the ball when the ball comes in your hands. I don't care if you're 0 for 15, you better shoot that next shot like it's about to go in. If that's the job and that's he's that microwave piece and that was the expectation this entire season, then by all means, no criticism. It just wasn't his year. You know what I'm saying? Um, but if it was more so to assist for him to assist at, with the development of like guys like Keontae George when he was paired with him at the beginning of the season when he was starting, and then later on in the season just helping them along from the bench from that standpoint, then I would be a little bit harsher on him. The Warriors are locked into the tenth playing spot because if you go to the titles, they both fail. <laughs> Cause you said Kerr, I said Beth. Yo, what? Cause he showed me a dollar. <laughs> yeah, Keontae definitely was a beneficiary of us when we were hot. I think the Warriors could finish ninth if the Lakers lose some games. I don't see the Lakers doing it though. The Lakers are on a pretty strong streak right now. And they're playing pretty consistent basketball. I don't see them slipping down. I could see them actually rising a little bit, but I think the Warriors are just a little bit too far out of touch. Like they're at this stage in the season. If we're 10 games ago, then I think that's a, a valid case to make. You said, are the Nuggets better than the Jazz or are the Jazz worse than the Nuggets? The Jazz are just worse than the Nuggets. It's not even about the Nuggets being better. The Jazz just rolled out anything. <laughs> Flair. Thoughts on Luka being a top five point guard all time once he gets MVP and a chip? No. Is that crazy? I'm 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 going no. Let me see something. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna look this up. Top fifteen point guards of all time. I'm gonna look up a random a random pages thing. All right, so we're gonna look at clutch points article they made in august of last year so they have i'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom or to the top i guess of the list now understandably so they list curry as at one they have magic johnson at two they have isaiah thomas 
at three from the Bad Boy Pistons. They have Oscar Robinson at four. They have John Stockton at five. They have Chris Paul at six. That's fair. I don't think he's better than any of those guys at the point guard position. Russell Westbrook at seven. Still taking Russell Westbrook over him. Respectfully. Respectfully, though. Steve Nash. I think that's where it kind of starts having a, becoming a conversation. I think that's where it kind of. Not, not, oh, yeah, give me Luca, But, like, it's like, maybe. But I, I, I don't know if I'm biting that hard. Just because, like, if you look at the raw numbers, accolades-wise, Steve Nash two MVPs, eight-time All-Star, seven-time All-NBA, five-time assist leader um, for his career, 14 and a half points per game, eight and a half assists, three rebounds, and about 0.7 steals. Um, not necessarily a cone on defense, but also not, you know, not 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 straps, not put a, put a boy in a car seat kind of guy. But at the same time, still. You know what I'm saying? Then you got your Walt Frazier's, your Jason Kidd's, your Kyrie Irving's. Well, they have Kyrie at 11. That's interesting. Then you have De they had Dame, Bob Cousy, Gary Payton, Tiny Ultra Ball, Tony Parker at 16. Uh yeah, so I, I I know for a fact he's definitely top 15. If he wins a championship and MVP, definitely top 15. I might be inclined to go top 10. Because at 10, who do we say? Well, do I want him over Dame? Do I want him over Kyrie? If he is the focal point of the offense when they win a championship, that automatically puts him above both Dame and Kyrie, right? Especially if he does it with the Mavericks. Um, I would say that also puts him above Jason Kidd, which would effectively put him in the top 10. And then it's a question of, okay, do you want him over Walt Frazier or Steve Nash all time? And then from there, I think that next conversation is Russell Westbrook. And then Chris Paul and Stockton are basically the same kind of conversation. So then that's a, a lump sum kind of thing that you put together. But yeah. That's interesting. Um, 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 I wish we would have given Hendricks minutes at that time. Yeah. I think that, oh, you think that's his ceiling? Mm. I can see it. I can see it. But defensively, things have to get better. Or, or his, the coaching staff has to scheme to allow him to be less of a net negative. Because the way that man be getting buckets put on his head, like the true shooting percentage and just the overall field goal percentage from opponents versus specifically Luka is actually like scary. Because it's like, not only are they saying, hey, we're going to pick on that boy. The coaching staff is also not scheming him so that he does not get picked on. So what do they do? They go, as soon as they say, hey, yo, bring 77 here. You know what they do? They bring 77 right to his right to whoever's doorstep. 77 began cooked. <laughs> so at that point, you got to drop 30 because they about they put in about 35 on your head at, at with a community effort. You know, it'd be what it be. So you said Lakers are tied. How does Sacramento for eighth? Looks like they're peaking right now. Mm -hmm. Oh no, you're good, Jackson. What's good, my guy? Remember when the Jazz blew him out midway through the season? Yeah, I'll never forget that one. That was great basketball. Stats, health, longevity, total wins, etc. Someone said the Jazz will have negative wins next season, meaning they lost to G League teams. That's hilarious. Paul is a better shot creator, but John had no fear to sacrifice body, still come back. Rather, he was known for his legendary long capacity. I will say this. Uh, it, admittedly, right, uh, we're going to say – I'm going to go ahead and give the edge health-wise to John Stockton because even though John Stockton was still injured, he would play he would play hurt, right? He didn't really play injured too often, but he played hurt, like like kind of really hurt, like rib cage. Ah, ah, I'm breathing and I'm hurt. I'm in pain, kind of hurt. And back then, painkillers didn't hit the same way they hit in today's day and age, right? Um, at the same time, Chris Paul had more severe injuries, like. The because when I whenever I think back to like the Lob City days with the Clippers, it was always somebody getting hurt, and that's what prevented the Clippers from being as great as they could have been. Now they did have the one year where I think who was it? They faced off against like the the Harden Rockets or something, and they were like things looked really good, but like for the most part, Chris Paul has had his his lesser injuries. He's been willing to sit out. But at the same time, he's also had more severe injuries, and those are the ones that really hampered his availability, um, which sucks, which sucks, you know. But 
uh, no matter how you look at it, John Stockton was available for more time, and he was because of that he was able to put up uh, more. He no, he put up consistent numbers in spite of his injury proneness, and that ultimately is what allowed him to have the longevity that he had. Meanwhile, Chris Paul had more injuries that you probably couldn't couldn't play through, and even if he tried to play through, there's no way he could have gotten those same numbers career wise. But yeah, I, honestly, I, I you can go either way in that conversation. I'm willing to entertain both sides. I don't think there's a right or wrong in that one. It's not like saying, oh, yeah, Zaza Pachulia is a top five center of all time, right? <laughs> like, 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 no, it's not that crazy. Oh, he said, I swear if they match the current Jazz roster with 0 and 26 Pistons, we lose by at least 20. It would be nasty. It would be nasty. It would be a, a nasty game. I think we'd come out with the edge, though. I think we'd come out with the edge. I'm not going to lie. We'd probably win by seven, win by seven or six. Come down to the wire, two minute drill. We just got to, we just got to get it done, which is disgusting to say, by the way, as much as I'm smiling about it. John Better. And that's if we are at home. End of convo. But I don't think they're that bad. <laughs> Luca has an advantage where all the point guards are small. He played in Magic's days. He would be bullied. Magic Oscar Magic. I don't know. I don't know. Who's the best player in jazz history? The minor, <laughs> the minor finder is crazy. Or John Stockton. Uh Stockton. Obviously, uh, you know, back in that day, particularly. Could certain bigs be effective without elite point guards or point guards to get the ball to their hands and put them in position to score? Of course. But at the same time, a lot of what we were able to see out of him was because of John Stockton in existence in the first place. So give me, give me Stockton. Plus, if we're back in the bad boy days, guys like Luca wouldn't get a shot off. Uh, because of Luca's shot selection, I think he would still get a shot off. Now, the floaters definitely probably wouldn't come out. The floaters wouldn't be a thing, and a lot of his uh, he would be deterred from going from attacking the basket at times because of the type of fouls that would be allowed to be considered common fouls. Um, now it also depends, obviously, on the rules that they play, right? Because if if you're allowing if you're allowing a uh, side ball carrying, that advantages Luca. But if you restrict Luca to having hand on ball, this game gets a lot. It gets a lot tougher to be shifty. I'm not gonna lie. I don't know anybody that I don't know about you guys. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not a full, I'm not a full 90 degree hold, right? I'm like, I'm like a good 60, 60 degree hold on a crossover, but Luke is a little bit lower on that spectrum. So if you demand that he has his hand up here, that boy's getting called crazy. Um, and there's also going to be a very difficult, uh, a great level of difficulty for him just to get like comfortable shots off, even though his game is very jumper dependent. You said Kate, whoa. Brother, what? He's, oh, what's up, Logic? You said hello, and I can see Luca getting top five. He has teammates around him. He plays good 15, 20 years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I'm I'm down with that. Boy, that's a crazy take. Katie's low-key better than LeBron. He had a better impact. No. Hot take. You are my sunshine. LeBron is most overrated all the time. <laughs> I'm weak. Dropping by for a sec. Nice hair. Appreciate you, Epic. Have a good night, buddy. Now that the honeymoon is over with Hardy, do you think of him as a what do you think of him as a coach? I see him get bullied by other by the better coaches. He's still learning. Cat is better than Lowry Flair. Shut up. Stop it right there. I've seen Cat get worked by people that should not be capable of working him. Uh Cat is the most bag ha bag heavy man who still isn't the reason his team wins, right? We had to bring a dog. We had to bring an actual dog in there to make the Timberwolves real, right? Nobody respected the Timberwolves. We had to bring an actual dog in there. Anthony Edwards, that's an actual, that's what a dog looks like. That's what a boss looks like. And you know what he's doing? He's following the leader. Jimmy Butler couldn't, didn't want to sit there and, and, and lead them through that. Anthony Edwards said, I got it. They added Rudy Gobert to make up for his defensive ineptitude, 
And the first year really did not mesh well. This year, a lot better. A whole lot better. But no, for that reason, no. No shot. Barely a better shooter. Just barely. Um, that's because he has more of a dribble game than, than Lowry does, in my opinion. Where are we? Oh, but uh, as far as Kurt was concerned, uh, your question about Will Hardy, I do like Will Hardy. I do like Will Hardy. He's learning, right? I've seen a, I've seen him do a lot of things that work. I've seen him do a lot of things with some personnel that should not work. That actually does work. I've seen him believe in people that should not be believed in. <laughs> I've seen him run rotations where it's like, "Yo, brother, what are we what are we doing right now?" Um, and then he lets it play out, lets a good decent number of minutes over a certain span of the season play out, and then they find we finally never have to see that rotation again. Um, sometimes I wish it wouldn't happen that way, but I understand there has to be a reason for why they do things analytic wise. And the game is now very analytics based. It's not just a feel for the game thing anymore. I think long-term with the right pieces, he can do some great things. I'm, I'm a Will Hardy believer. I was never like, Oh my God, he's coach of the year. He's the greatest coach of all time. That's not what I was going to say ever. I was, I'm very fond of the developments that he's made so far and what he can potentially make. I think there's some guys where it's like, can we make this person buy in on defense? Because if you have an elite defense, right? If you have a top 10 defense, no matter how bad your offense is, you can have a close game. But if you have a great offense, but a eh defense, you're going to be in shootouts all the time. And we've seen how the Jazz play in shootouts. We don't win. We played against the, I'll, I'll use the Phoenix Suns games as an example. Score, we were scoring like 120, but we were giving up 135. <laughs> and so it just didn't work that way. But yeah. Um, it said 17 of 20 seasons he played all 82. Yeah, that'll do it. I'd like to point out Stockton was the worst shooter of all time. Shooter in a time where threes were rare. Mm -hmm. Dude messed up with Cousins. Ah, oh, size of Shaq and sleek as the Kevin Garnett. They held a lot. It was a lot. I wish I got to see healthy Boogie. Man, look. Him in New Orleans with AD might have been the only recent, like the only current Twin Towers lineup that I could have potentially seen be a genuine contender. Like I really wanted to see it and then we couldn't see it. It was nice until it wasn't, basically. Held a lot. It was allowed. Yeah. Nice glasses. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Enough talk about Luca. He can shoot. He's not top ten. I'm still alive. Yes, sir, Lee. Yes, sir. Gideon could probably back down. Cat. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I'm with you on that one, Jackson. I'm with you on that one. Cat is the dog on that team. What do you mean? Flare, 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 flare. Are we trolling? Or are we serious? Flare. Are we trolling? Or are we serious? Cat is the dog on that team. What do you mean? You mean the man that scored 60 and his team still lost because he was shot chucking and couldn't get a good bucket? Some closer he is. Some dog he is. Have you seen those? Uh, let's not even say the career. Let's not even say the career shooting percentages by opponents against Carl Anthony Towns. Look at this year. Opponent shooting percentages versus specifically Carl Anthony Towns. Not defensive, not net defensive rating when he's on the floor versus when he's off. Right, because that's going to be skewed because most of his minutes are played alongside Rudy Gobert. That's the point of them getting Rudy Gobert, right? Isolated and just make it about him. I I'm not going to lie. There's there's only a couple guys in the league where I don't like their game, or I I respect I understand how they're good at what they're doing, what they do, and I have a short list of things that they're really really great at. But for me, the things that they don't do well pisses me off so much I can't like them as a player. But I'll never discredit what they are good at. For example, Carl Anthony Towns is one of those guys. Another guy, James Harden. I can't, I don't like James Harden. I'm not gonna lie. I I I just I just don't. I just don't. I haven't liked James Harden for a long, 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 long time. But I respect the I respect what he does. I respect the way he orchestrates his game. I have to. He's so good at what he does. It demands respect, right? No matter how I feel about it. If I'm genuinely a student of the game, like I say I am, I have to accept. No matter how I feel about his game, it works for one. For two, to a certain extent, it gets the job done. So you have to respect it for what it's worth. 
It's kind of like Grayson Allen. A lot of people don't like Grayson Allen as a player, but that man's shooting uh, that man's shooting insane lights out right now. Like, hold on. I I need to I need to I need to I got to I got to pull up these numbers actually. Uh we'll go matter of fact, we'll go stats muse. Stats muse. All right. So we're going to pull up Grayson Allen, right? Grayson Allen averaging 14 points, 5 rebounds, 3 assists, uh, uh, 1.2 steals, 0.6 blocks, only 1.6 turnovers, shooting 42.4% from the field. Oh, wait, no, no, this is over the past uh, five games. Whoops. Sorry, regular season. Uh, started in, all, in 71 games so far, 33 and a half minutes a game, 13.5 points per game, 3.9 rebounds, 3.1 assists, 0.9 steals, 0.6 blocks, 1.3 turnovers, shooting 50% from the field and 46.6% from three to go along with 87% from the free throw line. Um, now, if I'm a little, if, if it will let me dig a little bit deeper, I want to see how many attempts he's taking. Uh, tied for a career high. 5.9 three-pointers a game. So he's taking slightly more threes than Keontae George's and hitting over 14% more. So no matter how much we do or don't like Grayson Allen, hey, that man a bucket right now. That man is a that man is a catch and shoot, got catch and shoot on Hall of Fame. He got all the badges. That 2.8 for 5.9 ain't nothing to play with. We're just lucky he's only averaging. Uh, he's averaging a career high thirteen and a half points, but we're just lucky that he, that's all he's averaging, right? That's what we're appreciative of. And he's always been a great shooter overall in his career. He shoots forty one point point uh, two percent with the Jazz in eighteen nineteen. He shot thirty two percent. That was the lowest mark that he's ever had. Then he went forty point four percent on three point seven attempts, thirty nine percent on five and a half attempts, forty one percent on six attempts. Uh, forty percent on five attempts, and now forty six, which is a career high mark. Like literally, he can miss five. He can miss. So he takes five point nine threes a game. He can miss five point nine the rest of the season, and he'll still have a career high average from three point shooting from three point range. That's how serious it is. But yeah, um, you said cat is a bad is bad is a bad center. He wants to be a small forward. Yeah. Maybe he's playing out of position. You think that's what it is? Maybe he's just playing out of position. But he also doesn't look like he has the conditioning to do all that. That's the thing. But like Lee said, man, hit that like button. Um, I'm feeling the swag, bro. I appreciate it. Stockton had underrated shooting for his time, for sure, for sure. Being serious, being serious is crazy. Flair, Flair got to be trolling. Cat is the best in the league. Okay, yeah. See, you lost me. You lost me right there. I know you're trolling. Oh, you said except for Embiid and Jokic. On God is crazy. Flair, you're fired. You're 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 done talking. You've you've lost privilege. You've lost reading privileges. You are now a litter from the rest of the for the rest of the day. <laughs> Same guy who said crazy better than Tim all time. Crazy. No, he wasn't the best three-point shooter in the league among sitters. He was the best uh, three-point shooter in the league among sitters. Yep, that's all. That's all. Harden, another Carmelo. Yeah, but I liked watching Carmelo ISO. Like, there's something about that. That, mm -hmm. that what? That The jab step demon. What? I don't know. Uh, of course, I didn't love Mel. I, I was never a Knicks fan, but Mel, I, I'm originally from New York. Melo almost made me a Knicks fan at one point because that man was just, he was just different, man. Prime Melo was just different, man. Hoodie Melo was just different, man. He had a different aura. Like, like Harden is good at the game, but at the same time, I feel like he doesn't put in a, an extreme amount of work. I feel like he coasts more on talent and just, be, some of those guys just have that knack, and I think he has it. I think that Carmelo, like, pushes himself just a little bit harder. Like I think I think Melo was like a really like about a bucket twenty four seven type of guy. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm out of pocket for that. We said Luca under Harden under Stockton under Grayson. <laughs> Cat is the only reason that no great numbers can't deliver postseason. Mm, we should have kept them. Who'd have thought though? He does have a nastiness to him. I don't know if it's a positive nastiness, but it's definitely a nastiness. I think he suits him. I think he suited well alongside Kevin Durant. Very much so. THT getting better at threes. Hardy wasted his asset. I'm not going to lie. THT at the beginning of the season was god awful. He was god awful. 
the defense, the defense that THD is privy to playing doesn't really suit the system that the Jazz run. And then offensively, he just wasn't capable of sharing the ball the way that they needed him to. And I think that was what made the biggest issue and the reason why he ended up ultimately losing minutes. Um, and then you saw guys like Chris Dunn specifically do what do exactly what Hardy and the Jazz organization wanted from a point guard for the time being. And THT couldn't do that. And so Chris Dunn became the logical um, one to go to. I've always been a proponent for trading THT, but we weren't able to at the deadline. His contract's about to expire. So I think they're just giving him an opportunity to like put up numbers here and there so that he can show other coaches, hey, I'm here. I'm about to be a free agent. I'm good. Um, I'm not a bad player. I'm making steps in the right direction. Guys, please, you know, take a chance on me. Just sign me. I don't think that's fair. I, th I think that's the best thing that we can't do in the situation. Put in a good word for him. Um, too many players that are puppies that want to be petted. Grayson is a pit bull. You raise a good point. Luca over Stockton. That that's od. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's od. Um, besides, my God, Javon Carter. <laughs> Melo wanted to play in a fur coat. <laughs> My sunshine, Javon Carter. Y'all are foolish. But yeah, man, you know. Here we are again. How are we feeling? MB Joker Cat. <laughs> Y'all are foolish. Yeah, that's how it be. Jazz fans, it's almost over here. Here's hoping a mild push in a gentle arc. Make sure cowhide glove hits home. Outtakes here. <laughs> I don't know, Reed. It's a bottle of chart. Start coming. Jazz, start coming. I'm weak. There will be, we got a couple more games of the season. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I'll do some off season live streams just talking about random basketball. I got to go back to that list of everybody's responses so that I can talk about, you know, what we're, what guys are like leaning towards doing and things of that nature, because that'll be, that'll be good. Um, you know, just seeing what different teams do very well. Oh, that was oh Okay. 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 I got you. I got you. <laughs> but yeah, man. I appreciate you boys tuning into the live stream as always. Make sure to smash that like button, subscribe, turn on post notifications, become a member of the channel to help support the content. You know how we do, trying to outlast the remainder of the season and see what we could get out of this Jazz rookie group and just the smaller core just to see what we have with these gentlemen coming, you know? With that being said, as always, it's your boy Wraith Hoops. Thanks for tuning in this one. And as always, Good morning, good evening, and good night. No matter where you're on the globe watching, thanks for tuning in. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Yeah, the jazz ending season with 30 wins will be much more nice than 30 than 29.